Mr. Bruner uh, <laughs> letting me know that and uh, <clears throat> being prepared. I don't think we need to because the announcements are not all that long here today. Have I overlooked anything? Jim, have I overlooked anything? I should announce? No, okay, good. I think we got, we're covered here for what's coming up uh, later in the week and all of that. Well, as you heard in the sermonette, five days until the Passover comes. Next Thursday evening after sundown. Uh, what a wonderful occasion and time of year that this is and a very meaningful time of year. Uh, I've thought about this in comparison to the fall as we're all getting prepared in the fall to go to the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, <clears throat> and we're excited because we made our reservations and we have all of these things that we're going to travel and, and all of those things. And it is exciting and should be. But there's a certain, I think, different kind of excitement about this time of year. Because we think about the deep meaning of this and of the sacrifice of Christ. It is a memorial what it means to us even personally as well as collectively as a church. Um, there's something in that sense and way I think even much more uh, meaningful or in a different, maybe a slightly different way. Um, it is exciting. I look forward to it very much and I'm sure you do as well. Well, anyhow, I want to talk a little bit about this today as I did last week and talked a little bit about our preparing ourselves, examining ourselves. But this week I would like to talk, as we're very close to it, uh, <clears throat> explain the important steps in God's plan of salvation through the Passover and uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I'm going to begin by with the Passover. Uh, Passover is an interesting you know the story, of course, but you can turn to uh, Exodus 12. I'm going to go there as well. But uh, some comments I'd like to make leading up to that. It was the 10th plague. And uh, when you look at everything God does, there is a purpose in me. It wasn't just random, haphazard, though it took place. Everything is like it's all planned all of the plagues uh, were, uh, as you'll read in some of the Bible commentaries, uh, an affront and a destruction to the Egyptian gods. They worshiped those things, whether it's the frogs, the lice, or whatever it might have been. And uh, they were all being destroyed, every one of the gods of the Egyptians, and finally came up to the firstborn. And uh, <clears throat> why the firstborn? Well, apparently the Egyptians were also taking the lives of some of the firstborn of the Israelites who were in captivity. Janus and Jamres are mentioned later by Paul and Timothy, is it? And uh, <clears throat> uh, apparently they uh, may have been firstborn and died, priests of the Egyptian uh, uh, religion and gods who stood up to Moses. But uh, <clears throat> then it came down here to the final one, and it's interesting, 10, later God would write the 10 commandments on stone on the front and back for Moses to bring down from the mount. Um, it, you know, just interesting how everything, it wasn't being haphazard in how this was being carried out. And of course, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh after every one of those plagues. And then he went back on his word uh, of what he would or would not do until it came to this event. And here in Exodus uh, chapter 12, and there is a great deal of meaning behind this, uh, picturing from the physical to the spiritual in the New Testament that would come uh, <clears throat> uh, almost two millenniums later. But chapter 12 and in verse 1, now the word uh, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying that this month shall be your beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Um, it may not have always been the first month. You go back uh, there to the book of Genesis in the beginning. It looks like maybe the beginning of the seventh month, what is now the seventh month, may have been the beginning of the year at that time. And, of course, it is of the civil year. But this is the beginning of months of the spiritual year of the um, calendar. Uh, Nisan, well, of course, it was Abib, and it's now Nisan. That came from the Babylonian captivity, by the way. Uh, that's a, <clears throat> not a Hebrew name or word. Verse 2, this month shall be your beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to the children, uh, to the congregation of Israel, saying, on the 10th 
of uh, this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for, of, uh, for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, uh, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, as it goes on to say. In verse 6, now uh, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now let's comment here maybe on a few things. You're to find a lamb of the first year without blemish in any way. And you do that on the 10th day. Now what time of the 10th day would you do that? In the daytime or do it at the nighttime? You would do it in the daytime because you couldn't see at night unless you had an awful lot of lights around you whether this thing had any blemish on it or not. And then it's going to be with you. You take a lamb and, and you know, they can be uh, domesticated. They can be very, very um, uh, <clears throat> a wonderful pet, uh, <clears throat> believe it or not. We uh, saw that up in uh, years ago in Ohio. It had to do with a goat. Some friends of ours there in the, in the church, they uh, had this little goat they got for one of their um, daughters. And that little goat was the friendliest little thing just uh, because uh, she always went out to pet it and everything. And it just, I mean, <laughs> her, her father was saying, well, someday we'll probably have to um, the butcher, no, you're not going to butcher this little thing. It was just meant everything to her. It was quite cute. I'd come running as soon as you come out of the house and, and uh, the goat over there in his pen, and he would see the, the, the little girl coming out. Oh, he just jumped up on the fence and everything. He just wanted to see it. Just, uh, that, I mean, uh, <clears throat> she belonged to him and he belonged to her, I think is the way it looked at. And why am I telling you this? Because here you have an innocent little lamb for three and a half days is going to be in that house. Now, do you think it may have become somewhat attached to the children or even maybe the parents in that house in that time? And then you're going to cut its throat and kill it. And then you're going to roast it and eat it. You know, you begin to put the reality behind this. But there was a meaning in, behind all of this and the, that uh, God was teaching us. Now, from the daytime portion until the evening portion of the 14th is, interestingly, three and one half days. You're getting into the half day after three days when you go into the 14th evening after sundown. And yes, it says here twilight. I'm using New King James, but the other translations too of the English also show the same thing. After sundown. This was kept at the beginning of the 14th day of the first month. Now, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, the Jewish people got off track because they do not keep it at the beginning of the 14th day. They keep it at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 15th day, Friday night. Next Friday night will be the Jewish Passover. But it is not the Lord's Passover. The Lord's Passover is Thursday night. And it's interesting too that you have uh, many Protestant churches, they want to have what they call their Maudie Thursday. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, they recognized that Christ was uh, keeping the Passover uh, in that first century at that time. And so they keep it. Uh, they have a uh, celebration. I had a neighbor up in uh, North uh, Carolina, and uh, <clears throat> that's what they did. And they would have the Maudie Thursday. Now, Maudie is a Latin word. And I've forgotten now exactly what it means. But... Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, the one that Jesus Christ kept was on the 14th, on the 14th day of the beginning of the 14th. We've had at times in the Church of God people 
uh, get off and think, well, maybe it should be the 15th. There's been arguments over that in the past, and, but they are clearly wrong, uh, especially when it came to the original one. Some have argued that the original was on the 15th and will admit that in the New Testament that Jesus Christ kept it on the 14th, but the original was on the 15th. That is not true. There are about 14 scriptures in the Old Testament that tell us what day the Passover falls on. Everyone says it's on the 14th. There is not one scripture that says the Passover falls on the 15th. I think another argument, as I recall, that has been used about that is that, uh, well, yes, but it means really uh, at the end of the 14th. Well, at the end of the four, there's no twilight at the end of the 14th. There, the, the, when the, as we will see as we go along here, what, what constitutes a day in the Bible? Sunset to sunset. Let's... Um, uh, maybe while I'm here, let's go over here to Leviticus chapter 23, where all of the seven annual holy days are listed and, and uh, briefly described. Leviticus 23 and in verse 32 at the end on the Day of Atonement, it mentions this, it shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening or sunset. From evening, or that is sunset to sunset, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. And uh, <clears throat> another scripture I can just list to you is Joshua chapter 8 verse 29 also shows that the day ends and the new day begins at sunset. Because an individual who was the king of the little um, uh, town or uh, uh, of Ai, A-I, was executed and his body was hung until sunset and then it was brought down the end of the day uh, in Joshua's time as they were coming into the uh, promised land. Uh, coming back here though, <clears throat> uh, let's go back here now to um, uh, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, here is the beginning of the first Passover that was to be kept. And, of course, we know the story. You'll hear more about this as we uh, uh, get into it next week and as well. But uh, <clears throat> the, um, you keep it until twilight in verse 6. Now, there's only one twilight in each day. When it's a day begins and ends sunset to sunset. Because if somebody's going to argue, well, what about the twilight at the end of the day? All right, what about it? That's not the same day. When does twilight begin? It begins when the sun goes down. Twilight is the amount of light still shining from sunset to dark. Uh, it can be up to 30 minutes uh, depending on latitude and time of year as well as how, how um, uh, much it will be. So if you're going to, uh, somebody wants to argue that it should be, a, maybe it was the end of the 14th. No, it isn't. The end of the 14th is the 15th. You've started a new day. Uh, <clears throat> Friday evening, before the, when the sun goes down, next Friday evening, uh, <clears throat> until it becomes actually dark, that is twilight of the 15th, not twilight at the end of the 14th, because you have a new day. And the other day has already completed and finished. Uh, a couple other things here as we go along to see what was uh, to take place. Uh, they were, verse 8, then they shall eat the flesh on that night roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs and they shall eat it. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, uh, the whole flesh, nothing of course as you know was to be uh, uh, kept until the uh, morning, uh, dropping down. It was to, uh, of course, to be burnt with fire. Uh, verse 9, do not eat it uh, raw nor boil uh, at, uh, with water, but roast it in fire. And it is to be a complete uh, fire. And, of course, fire is what purifies, too. So it was to be a purified and um, a, a complete uh, offering. 
Uh, Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, uh, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And he actually was doing that through the plagues as well leading up to this. But this was the final one, you might say, uh, to top it all. And notice also what it says at the end of verse 11. It is the Lord's Passover. It's not man's. It's not the Jews. I had a person write to me a critical letter one time. Well, if you're going to keep all those days, why don't you do sacrifices? They believed that what we were doing was uh, Jewish. And uh, I wrote back, and it's not what the Bible says. It says it's the Lord's Passover. It didn't say it's the Jews' Passover nor the holy days. They're not the Jews' days. It says they are the Lord's days. Uh, Very interesting uh, of what this is picturing. I'd like to go in the New Testament. I'm going to come back here. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And uh, I hope I'm not doing too many that are going to be done on the Passover itself read that night but uh, actually if I even if I do that's okay we I think a certain amount of review uh, we never want to forget some of these things but here in first uh, Peter chapter 1 verse 19 and 20 but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot Yes, he was perfect. He was without sin, although tempted as all of us are, as it says. Verse 20, he indeed was foreordained or predestined, if you will, before the foundation of the world. The cosmos is the Greek word. And it not only means the earth, it means really the whole universe. Now we know from 1 John chapter 1 that he created it all, didn't he? And um, then also uh, Colossians chapter 1, he created everything, both physical, both uh, visible and invisible, uh, we read. So here he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, which he's the one that actually carried out the foundation, but was manifest in these last times for you. This was in the works, if you will, in God's great plan, before there ever was an earth, before there ever was a cosmos. And Jesus Christ was going to be that sacrifice that would be uh, worthy, that man was going to be created physical and would re- it would require a sacrifice. A couple other scriptures uh, along with this would be Uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 2 uh, where it says God who cannot lie uh, promised what from the beginning uh, that uh, man will be able to have access to eternal life. I'm messing it up. Let me just quickly read it. Uh, In uh, Titus chapter 1 and in verse 2 we'll get to it here in just a moment. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Promised before time began. Now, how would that promise be carried out? Through this lamb without blemish, Jesus Christ, the one who created us and made us. Uh, Also, it mentions this over here in uh, 2 Timothy 1 and in verse uh, 9. Uh, Paul understood this very well. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time, when did time begin? Well, it appears that time had to begin when the physical creation took place. What is time? Is there time in the spirit world? Is there time in heaven? Uh, what time is it up in heaven right now? Is he on Eastern time? What time is he on? Now, you, you look at it, it's, it's absurd, right? Uh, 
time to us is a measurement of how long this earth rotates, the moon goes around the earth, the earth and the moon in their orbit, how long it takes to go around the sun. Uh, how many earth day rotations does it take to go all the way around the 365 and a quarter, right? Now, what if you're on Pluto? What if you're on Mars, on Jupiter? You're in the same solar system. You're rotating around the same star, the sun. But it's a lot longer, isn't it? So time to us is a measurement of how long it takes to go certain distances and do certain things. We have it uh, set up so it takes 24, <clears throat> there are 24 time zones around the Earth, and it takes uh, 24 hours, doesn't it, to make a complete revolution and go around. What, you know, when you read something before time began, what time? Uh, I've read it a lot of cases, and I, I, can't, I can't say for sure, but apparently it may be true, from the time of the physical creation when things were made. Otherwise, what is time in the spirit world? What, would, what is time before the earth was created? What is time before the universe was created? Well, it's kind of difficult to explain, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> time does not seem to have, be a factor in the spirit world as far as God moving from one location to the other or things going on um, and all of that. Uh, we look at how old the earth is at times and see some of the incredible things out there in the western states in particular where the oceans have covered the uh, states and uh, left some incredible things uh, for us to look at and, and just wonder at they're so incredible. Uh, times when there was uh, creatures on this earth that uh, dinosaurs and so forth and they did not evolve they were created and uh, they're perfect creations for that age and, and uh, that uh, uh, creation that uh, was was created how long ago was that 160 million years we're told that it was well I can't argue one way or the other on that maybe it's true what is that to God <laughs> when it comes to time I don't, uh, if, they, if they are correct about that, it's meaningless in one sense to God. <clears throat> but coming back here to uh, this uh, uh, Passover, this was something that, uh, here is the beginning to a nation, and this was of course not for uh, spiritual salvation, but it would point to the coming of the Messiah who would be the sacrifice of all sacrifices. And uh, the lady that wrote me the letter one time, why don't you, if you're gonna keep those days, why don't you uh, practice the sacrifices and all of that? I wrote her back. We do have a sacrifice. And we have a memorial to it every year. It's called the Passover. And Jesus Christ is that sacrifice. And uh, God's way was so perfect that if sin entered in in any way, that it required death in order for that to be uh, in any way uh, rectified. And it had to be a death greater than the offender has committed. And uh, <clears throat> because it disrupts the order of everything that God has done to, uh, for sin. And uh, <clears throat> a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Well, let's move on here, but I, it's important to look and see. I'm back here now to Exodus 12. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a, a beginning to introduce this to man, and uh, especially to us in the church as we look back at it, and uh, which is, of course, historical to us as we look back. But there was in the very beginning, God had a plan, and it was going to require the sacrifice of his son, John 3.16. And uh, <clears throat> in order for uh, any of us to be able to have uh, sin rectified by he taking that death penalty on his head for us in our stead. <clears throat> All right, let's move over to um, Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. 
And just a couple um, things here. Again, uh, nothing new. This is kind of review day uh, <clears throat> to go over some of these things to make sure we that we do have this in our mind as we come to it every year and not just when we get there. Oh, yeah, I, oh, that's right. I forgot. It's been a year gone by. That's right. We do do that. Uh, <clears throat> know that we are thinking about these things and wanting to review. That's why he gave it to us and why we do repeat these holy days every year. Now, Leviticus 23, here we see uh, verse 4. There are, these are the feasts of the Lord. Notice, of the Lord. Holy convocations, commanded assemblies, which you shall proclaim in their appointed times. On, on, not, uh, it's interesting, this is a correct translation. Verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So there's a distinction there. Now, I recall, and I didn't bring it with me, but I have read it. In fact, I think I've quoted from it in the past, Josephus' book on Antiquities of the Jews. In his time, he mentions when he covers and is covering that portion of what we call the Old Testament, which he probably would not, he would call the Testament, <coughs> that the time of the Passover and unleavened bread was not seven days. It was eight days. Now today, to the Jewish community, it's seven days. But it was not always that. It was eight days, which shows there was a separation. Now I have a quote from the Jewish Study Bible, which I thought was quite interesting. And I'd like to read that uh, here to you. On Leviticus 23, verse 5, what we just read. The Jewish study Bible, quote, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, end of quote. Then the comment. The date of the evening is that of the preceding day. The preceding day is the 13th, right? The day before. Only in post-biblical tradition was the method reversed and evenings given the date of the following day. The 15th. That's what the, <clears throat> the author of the Jewish uh, Study Bible is writing here, a comment on the side there uh, of uh, Leviticus 23, verse 5. Uh, <clears throat> yes, the 14th begins the previous day. If you look at it the way man keeps time from sunset, I mean, uh, midnight to midnight. So when he's writing the commentary, the previous day to the 14th when the Passover was kept uh, previously would be the evening. Uh, you may call it the evening of the 13th, but it isn't. It, it, evening of the 13th in the way man counts a day, but it is the evening of the 14th in the way God counts a day in the Bible. Remember, man is midnight to midnight. God is sunset to sunset. So, very interesting comment coming from this particular source, uh, <clears throat> which I have in my library at home. Uh, another place, just to show again, uh, it makes it very clear, is over here in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 28, Numbers 28. It really should never be something uh, that people would argue over. Um, I'm surprised even that the Jewish community does what they, that they, uh, they have these same scriptures. They can read just the same thing I'm reading. Every scripture in the Old Testament, uh, <clears throat> from the book of Exodus all the way to chapter 45 of the book of Ezekiel in the millennium, the Passover is on the 14th. And uh, <clears throat> not one scripture Will, uh, will indicate the 15th at all, or even say it. Uh, <clears throat> here in uh, Numbers 28, and here you have, uh, well, let's see, verse 16 and 17, offerings at the Passover. On the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. It says, on the 14th, when does the 14th begin? Is it the daytime 
or is it at sunset the previous evening? That is on the 14th. When it comes 7.55 Thursday evening of this coming week, the 14th, it is on the 14th. The 13th has just ended. On the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the, of the Lord, and on the 15th day of this month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's so simple. And yet, uh, such an argument uh, over this. Well, of course, the uh, final decision on this comes in the New Testament. Let's take a look at this real quickly. Jesus Christ, I don't want to spend too many, because some of these scriptures are going to be read on the Passover to you. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 22, verse 14 and 15, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him, and he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover. What day was that? That day was the 14th day of the first month. Now, notice if we turn over here to the book of John, because there are two verses showing that uh, the Jews did not keep the Passover on the same day Jesus and his disciples kept it. And this, uh, I think, is important, and we are familiar with these scriptures. If this argue, you know, this argument seems like it goes around and comes around ever, ever, you know, so, ever so many years uh, in the church, uh, where you uh, hear somebody coming up and they uh, believe that they, uh, we keep it on the wrong day. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Here in John 18, verse 28... 18, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning. But they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the pa they hadn't eaten the Passover. The Passover was going to be that coming evening. And then if you turn the page over to chapter 19, verse 14, you see it once again. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover when he was arrested, brought before Caiaphas in the early morning hours, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they hadn't kept the Passover, had they? And just like today, they won't keep it until Friday night. They will not be keeping the Passover on Thursday evening, uh, the 14th, the beginning of the 14th. So just so that we understand and clearly see, yes, indeed, it was to be at that time. And <clears throat> so uh, this is the very beginning. God is giving this to the Israelites in Exodus chapter 12. Everything that they are doing, which there will be more explanation about that later, all had meaning and meaning for uh, not only that day, but for the future to come. All right, let's step forward a little bit here. Uh, <clears throat> who should participate in the Passover? Everybody? Let's notice back in Exodus chapter uh, 12. Exodus chapter 12. Once again, we see uh, this is verse uh, 43 through 48. <clears throat> And in verse 43, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it. Why? Well, we'll see. But every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten, but and you shall not carry any of the flesh outside the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. That's very interesting, by the way, because that statement <clears throat> is before Psalm 22 was ever thought of, let alone written by David, in which he prophesied there in Psalm 22 that not a bone would be broken. 
That must have been understood even before David wrote that. <coughs> uh, coming back here. Um, All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. But verse 48, and when a stranger dwells with you and wants to keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be a native of the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat it. Where did circumcision come from? It goes back to Genesis 17. God gave it to Abram, Abraham then, as a sign of entering into the covenant that God was making. We call it today the Old Covenant. Uh, The Jews would call it the covenant. Uh, When they came in out of uh, Egypt, in Leviticus 12, verse 3, it says they were to all be circumcised. They weren't circumcised in Egypt. And uh, they actually had to be in order to partake of this and would from there on after. But that's the Old Testament, right? What about in the New Testament? Does God require that in the New Testament? Yes. Looking at me kind of funny, huh? Well, let's go take a look and see. How about, let's go to Colossians chapter 2. No, he does not require physical circumcision to take the Passover. He does require something else, doesn't he? (laughs) Excuse me. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12. In him, Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, not by surgery, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. There is a circumcision today. It's baptism, preceded by faith, repentance, then going into the water. And after coming out of the water, having hands laid on one's head to receive the Spirit of God. Um, God wants all to be able to take of it. But we can't put the cart before the horse. We have to come here and first of all accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in faith to repent and have and to be baptized in order to partake of the Passover every year. And uh, God wants us to do that. And uh, <clears throat> certainly uh, uh, he wants us to come to that point. One other thing that I want to mention about circumcision. I'm going to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. This is the circumcision that God really wants. The physical in the beginning and as Egypt, or Israel came out of Egypt points to what? The spiritual. What really is there? But they were a physical nation. They weren't being called to conversion. There may have been a few like Moses, maybe and Joshua and so on. <clears throat> but for the most part, the entire nation was very physical minded and did not see things uh, in a spiritual sense at all. Uh, In Deuteronomy, let's see, what did I tell you? Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer, self-willed, stubborn. Change your attitude, your spirit, is what Moses is inspired to write here. This is the circumcision that God wants of the heart, of the mind, uh, of the being. Now this is uh, repeated in chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. In chapter 30 and in verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul or being that you may live. This is what God desires. 
Now, if we go over to Romans chapter 2, Paul was very familiar with what I just read. Romans chapter 2, and in verse 29. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, Holy Spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. Yes, this, where did you think Moses got that from? Obviously from Deuteronomy. And uh, <clears throat> understood what the real meaning. Now circumcision was a big thing in the first century. Anywhere there was a Jewish community. That was uh, the most important thing. Well, if you're going to become of the seed of uh, Abraham, you have to be circumcised. Paul had to battle that. That's the reason for the Jerusalem conference, Acts 15. To come to realize that was no longer necessary. Now, it's fine for hygienic purposes and reasons, but certainly is not something that uh, <clears throat> had for spiritual and for eternal life uh, to be carried out. One other one here is in Philippians 3. Philippians 3 and in verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Yes, the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, that has been given to us as a gift upon our <clears throat> repentance in faith and uh, accepting the sacrifice of the Son of God in place of ours, of, our, of us having to be sacrificed. Notice another one, really, of course, uh, how does one receive God's spirit? Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 2, uh, when they ask Peter, what should we do? Repent, he said. Repent, be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But there was one little detail about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit left out there. You have to go to Acts chapter 8, where, <clears throat> what, Peter and John came down from Jerusalem after... Uh, Philip had baptized in Samaria. <clears throat> they had not received the Holy Spirit. They had had their sins forgiven. But the apostles had to come down and lay hands on them. And that's, of course, where you have the story of Simon Magus comes in. Peter was not going to lay hands on him. But the point is, they had to receive the Holy Spirit. And it had to come through the laying on of hands of the ministry of uh, Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> notice um, here in Romans uh, chapter 8 and in verse 9, Paul writes, But you are not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not, he's not a Christian. Here's where you have the simple definition <coughs> of, a, of a Christian. <clears throat> One who has the Spirit of Christ, which is also the Spirit of God. He is God. Look at verse 11. But if the Spirit of him, Christ, who raised, or spirit of him, the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Holy Spirit, I added holy, that's what it means, who dwell, or should be, which dwells in you, which dwells in you. Now that's important, very important. I believe we're all here because we want eventually to have eternal life. No, I don't want eternal life, I just, but I thought I'd just show up. No, ridiculous. We're here because we want eternal life. We want to be a son of God in the family of God. Otherwise, we'd be out doing something else. So I mentioned this. Let's look at this. If for whatever reasons we have put off 
repentance and baptism, think about it seriously. We never know from one day to the next uh, what may happen. And <clears throat> we want our sins forgiven and we want to receive God's spirit. Uh, <clears throat> especially in the time and the age that we live in. And none of us are spring chickens anymore, right? <laughs> We're all getting a little bit older. So just look at that I'm, I, and think about that. Pray about that. It's very important. What kind of a baptism should it be? I've had people every year, I think, <clears throat> mention to me, well, I was baptized. I was baptized, you know, umpteen years ago, and I believe I repented. And I don't doubt one's sincerity. How were you baptized? I think I've told you this before. When I went <clears throat> to baptize an individual I've been counseling with for some time, minimum security prison in um, North Carolina, I had to go through the chaplain. And, uh, well, you know, he was reluctant at first, but then finally he said, uh, well, can I use it too? And I said, well, uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? Well, I've been counseling individuals, but he didn't have a tank. See, I had a portable tank. I still have that tank, too, by the way, that it's made out of the material you would <clears throat> um, use on boats to keep them from uh, leaking, patching and everything. We had a, an upholster who actually made that, just a nice little aluminum frame, take it apart, fold it up, on your way. <clears throat> So I, well, I said, fine. So we got to the date and time and filled the tank up outside. How was that? It was outside the kitchen of their prison. And uh, I baptized this gentleman. And uh, <clears throat> afterwards, he got out and kind of dried his face off. And then I laid my hands on him and prayed for God to impart his spirit. Then we stepped back. And this fellow, the other, the chaplain there, had about, I don't know, six or seven individuals that he wanted to baptize. So he got them in there and <clears throat> got into the water. In the name of Jesus, down, up. Next one, in the name of Jesus, down and up. There was nothing about repentance. There was no prayer and laying on of hands following that at all. I always kind of wondered what he thought because... We went first, and there was the prayer and the laying on of hands. He had no intention, I guess, of ever doing it. My point of bringing that up is those individuals may have been sincere, but they were not receiving God's spirit in that manner or in that way. And I don't think they were being taught the truth about repentance either leading up to that uh, baptism. I was baptized originally <clears throat> when I was one year of age. I don't have fond memories of it. Uh, <laughs> only what my mother told me about it. And she did because she didn't really have a religious background to speak of, but um, one of my aunts said, well, you need to take him to church. He's a year old, Lutheran church. And uh, you need to uh, have him baptized, I guess, so in case I died, I wouldn't go to hell. I would be saved as a child. My mother said I resisted all the way. And uh, <clears throat> I bawled all the way through it. And uh, <clears throat> it's kind of funny. It brings up another incident. I had a... What, I wanted to baptize an individual I was counseling with in another prison. I had to go through the chaplain again. No, we, we can't allow you to bring in your uh, <clears throat> uh, baptismal tank. But uh, you, we can do it here. All you, we, can, we, can, uh, we do it by just dabbing three times on the forehead. Uh, <clears throat> well, that won't work because we know that baptism is an untranslated Greek word, meaning if the Greek Navy gets into a battle and they sink a ship, they baptize it, baptizo. And uh, immersion goes under. 
Uh, <clears throat> but it was interesting, the different ones you run into that way. Then another one in the state prison at Raleigh, North. That chaplain, he didn't want to let us baptize any prisoners in his prison. I baptize them. They're, they're part of my congregation. <laughs> so he wouldn't let, uh, and he had a tank in the prison built there just for that. But no other minister could come in and baptize a prisoner in, that, in the state prison in, in Raleigh. <clears throat> he took care of that. You're stepping into my territory. Well, anyhow, <clears throat> all of this comes back to the point it is important, step by step, how we are baptized. You go back to the autobiography. Herbert Armstrong didn't just, uh, he wasn't attending any church, as I understand it at the time. <clears throat> he had to go through about two or three different ministers before one would do it according to what the Bible shows. And a lot of them would not follow. And no, we won't do it that way, but he did find one who did. And uh, so that's uh, how uh, then he was uh, baptized. And it had to be by immersion, and there had to be the laying on of hands and the prayer following. And that's what the Bible shows. And uh, the uh, ceremony of the laying on of hands is very important throughout the Bible. And you have it for about four different reasons. Anoint, uh, the Moses laid hands on Joshua for him to become leader in his place. Ordination is by laying on of hands and prayer. Blessing of the little children is laying on of hands. If you're sick, laying on of hands and the prayer for God's healing and intervention. <clears throat> and so likewise with baptism, following uh, coming out of the water to receive God's spirit is by the laying on of hands and the prayer with it, of course. So I mentioned that. Um, <clears throat> there's an example in the Bible. I'll get to it real quickly here. It's in Acts chapter 19. Let's take a look at this, Acts 19. And verses 1 through 7, brand new church at Ephesus. Interesting, started with 12 men and their families. It happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So much as, uh, uh, well, they said, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Well, obviously he hadn't received it if they hadn't heard about it. <clears throat> and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? And so Paul knew they had been baptized into John's baptism. Now, would John's disciples be considered to be false ministers? No. They were to do following what John had taught them. They would have been considered also God's ministers and uh, uh, disciples here. <coughs> well, <clears throat> verse 4, then Paul said, Well, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were rebaptized. Do you see that? They'd already been baptized. Now they're baptized again. Why, why didn't Paul just lay hands on them? Well, okay, you were baptized correctly. You were immersed. It was by proper... Uh, instruction, counsel from John's disciples who had been trained by John. So all we need to do is just lay hands on them. That's not, that's not what Paul did. Verse 6, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues or languages, it should be, and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. Good number founding the new church there in Ephesus, which became a very large church Later, Timothy, I think, was the main uh, evangelist and pastor there, and, and that's where he was martyred in the 80s uh, in the first century. All of these things we should consider and look at. 
most people, when they've come to me about taking Passover, and I've been baptized before, and I ask, what kind of baptism? Well, I was baptized by immersion. Okay, did you have the laying on of hands? I never heard of that. I didn't know about that. Nobody said anything to me about that. Well, then, let's go back to Acts 19. Why is it there? Maybe because it tells us, well, what we should do. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing bad or anything like that. But let's do it the way God wants it done. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, so that um, uh, you can be of good conscience in, in taking it and, as God wants you to do. All right. Now, I'm going to go back here to um, Exodus. There's something else. Let's move on from Passover to the beginning of the feast. Uh, <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12 again. We have a wonderful tradition based upon some very important things that took place in Exodus 12 that we keep in the church, as you know. And it's for the whole family. Because it was the day that Israel came out of Egypt, which is the day following the Passover, that we're led out of the Egypt of this world and out of our past sins into a new life. And it's a memorial. We keep it every year. There's actually two memorials. One is the Passover, and the other one is the first day of unleavened bread. Now, <clears throat> let's uh, notice here a couple of the scriptures. We can see this. Verse 14 of chapter 12. So this day shall be to you a memorial. What day? Well, chapter 13, verse 9 shows it's not the Passover we're talking about here. It's the first day, the 15th day, that is, the beginning of the feast. That's the day they came out of Egypt. They did not come out on the 14th. Um, <clears throat> and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast day by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat on leavened bread. And <clears throat> on the first day, uh, you shall remove the leaven. Of course, I, I don't want to read all of this. Um, and on the first day, there shall be a holy convocation, verse 16. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation, as we do every year. So we have service on the first day and on the seventh day as well. <clears throat> when did they come out of Egypt? They did not come out on the 14th. They stayed in their huts, houses, whatever, until morning. They were not to come out in, at night. Now during the day portion of the 14th day, they are assembling, they are getting ready. They are also receiving from the Egyptians all kinds of things uh, <clears throat> that they, uh, not robbing, but uh, that they were giving to them. They were also uh, in haste, they could not put any yeast into the dough and they came up with unleavened bread to leave town with. When did they leave? Well, they left in the evening, the beginning of the 15th, at sundown. They were leaving and heading toward the uh, sea. They weren't taking the shortcut, the northern route. They would run into some armies of uh, people that they were not prepared to run into. They weren't taking the central route across the Sinai either. Uh, some have tried to say, and I've even had a book given to me about that, uh, all the way over to the Gulf of, um, what's it, Aqaba on the other side, and that that's where the sea opened up, and there were supposedly Egyptian uh, uh, <clears throat> chariot wheels there at the bottom of this uh, particular, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, and all of that. Well, when I started examining and looking at it, that's an absolutely impossible. How would, you know how long that is, distance-wise, to go from <clears throat> the um, tip of this Gulf of Suez all the way across central Sinai to the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba? Over 250 miles. And they did it in six days. 
so they could go through the Gulf of Aqaba on the seventh day. And the Pharaoh was chasing them. He and his army all the way across central Sinai to the Gulf of Aqaba to catch up to them. Now, I just don't have enough faith to believe that. Uh, <clears throat> all you have to do is look at a map. No, uh, the place where the sea was opened on the seventh day of unleavened bread is the tip of the Gulf of Suez, what, what we call it today, or the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeves. And by that, uh, some people, you look at a map at the back of your Bible, it shows they did not go through the uh, <coughs> Gulf of Aqaba or the uh, Gulf of Suez, Red Sea. They got these bitter lakes up north of That is not correct. God opened up the Red Sea Gulf of Suez on the northern tip, and they went across on dry land. The Egyptians followed them into it, and they were drowned. That is where it was. I mentioned that. Some of you may have. It was a, a church member gave me that book, and uh, <clears throat> well, wanted me to comment on it, so I have. Uh, I, 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 I want to be polite, but I, I, there's no way that I can see that that would be acceptable. All right, let me uh, get back here to um, <clears throat> the beginning of the feast. If I can pick up my notes here where I left off. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to... Um, Yes, Exodus 12, now let's go to verse 40. This is the next event for us in the church today as we begin the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In verse 40, now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years to the selfsame day that that had promise was given to Abraham in Genesis 15, verses 13 through 21. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day it came to pass that all of the armies of Egypt or of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now verse 42, it is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations that they should uh, have. And it is also a <clears throat> memorial on the day they came out of the land. You don't want to forget that. We don't want to forget the day we come out of the Egypt of this world that we live in, do we? And <clears throat> so, yes, we have kept this as a time to have a nice meal together with brethren. We have no preaching service. And uh, we just simply have a blessing on the meal which includes even what the occasion represents to us, to us today. And while we're doing that, the Jewish community is going to be having the Seder meal for their Passover. No lamb. There's no temple. And so <clears throat> they, um, they just uh, do not have that anymore. A couple of comments about leavening. What is leavening? We are to put all the leaven out, as it said there in chapter 12, and verse 16 and so, uh, leading up to it. Well, anything that causes the dough to rise, obviously, three main ones. By the way, we have in this congregation, <clears throat> Mr. Leavening Man over here <laughs> gave an excellent sermon, an explanation of, of all the different types of leaven. But yeast, baking powder, baking soda are your three main ones that you can do. Some of you have the uh, article, maybe you do, maybe you don't, is it leavening that we've had available for every year in the church. We have leavening agents, things that are mentioned uh, there. <clears throat> I uh, was looking at stuff that I needed to put out of our freezer. <coughs> And uh, <clears throat> so I uh, asked my wife, I came across this, I, I, I like chicken nuggets. And I like what's on those chicken nuggets. And I thought, you know, I better look at the ingredients here. 
and I saw yeast. Not just yeast, it was yeast extract. And I asked my wife, <clears throat> is this leavening? And she said, no, it's not. Well, it's interesting, I went back to our article here and took a look at it. Guess what? Yeast extract, if you run into it, is not a leavening agent. Uh, <clears throat> there's more than one kind of yeast extract as well. It's a derivative of yeast which is sterile and it cannot leaven anything. Um, interesting to know. Um, brewer's yeast, been asked about that. Uh, cream of tartar. Well, cream of tartar or tar tartaric acid, potassium by tartarate or potassium hydrogen tartrate. This is an acid used to combine with baking soda, uh, <clears throat> but by itself, it is not a leavening agent. Cream of tartar, some of you asked that over the years, by itself will not graze anything. It has to be combined with another leavening agent that, well, another, a leavening agent, I should say. And there's some interesting ones here. So if you had questions and you haven't seen some of these things, uh, <clears throat> it's available and we can uh, make copies of it for you between now and then. But tomorrow's a good day if you haven't started already. <laughs> because for seven days we're to have the leaven out of our home off our property. That means by Friday night, sundown, Friday night, we should have the leavening out. I've told this before, I'll tell it to you again. 1978, my wife and I had the opportunity to be in Israel for Passover and unleavened bread. During the day portion of the 14th after the Passover, which we took the night before in Jerusalem, our uh, tour bus took us all the way up the West Bank. Yes, we could go through the West Bank that, at that time. And we ended up uh, two miles south of the Lebanese border at the oldest kibbutz in uh, Israel. <clears throat> Kafar... Kavadi or something like that. Had quite a history behind it too. Of, uh, <clears throat> especially because it wasn't that far to the Golan Heights from that particular uh, <clears throat> kibbutz. But uh, <clears throat> they had just gotten the uh, all the leaven taken out. We had came in there and they were going to feed us uh, dinner because we were on the tour and everything and of course uh, we had um, unleavened bread. We had um, roast beef tongue. And uh, <clears throat> my wife loved that. <laughs> I have to get all the skin cut around and off of it and everything. It wasn't that bad, though. But you know what I remember most about it? Not the meal. They told us that they had just gotten back from taking all of the leaven up to the border to the Lebanese. <laughs> and they would keep it for seven days and afterwards they would go up and bring it back. You know, you never want to let anything go to waste, right? <laughs> no, <clears throat> that is not what we are supposed to do. We try to use all of the leavened products in our home up before the feast comes. And what we have not used up, we throw out into the garbage. And uh, if the garbage doesn't come on, garbage comes on Friday, how about that on, in our, <coughs> our case? <laughs> but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes we've lived in places where the garbage would come by a couple days before the actual day you should have it out. Put it in a plastic bag, put it in the garbage, they can take it to the landfill. Get it off your property. It's a type of putting sin out of your life and not letting it come back in, as the Jews were doing with the Lebanese people. Lebanese liked it because they got paid for it. <laughs> paid to hold the leaven for seven days and then give it back to them. So... <clears throat> That's not what we do. We put it off of our property. We use it up, we get rid of it, whatever. And uh, then we go out after it's over with and we buy new leavening products. 
<clears throat> kind of goes along with almost like with 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And yes, during the days of unleavened bread, if you haven't already, most of you already know, if you want some unleavened bread, you can go to Publix, international area. By, I did yesterday, bought a couple of boxes of different kinds of matzos. Actually, I like matzos. And I like unleavened bread. And I love these unleavened pancakes my wife makes. They're like roll-ups, you know. You put jelly and things in them. It's delicious. Uh, all kinds, you know, there's, uh, we had our, I told this before, but years ago up in Ohio, the ladies, while we had Spokesman's Club in the wintertime, they worked on a recipe book of unleavened recipes. They sent it off to Kansas City to have it spiral bound. 400. We still have a copy of it uh, at home in one of the bookshelves. Uh, just uh, amazing. There's so many, and I've told you this before, my wife, she's not here, so I'll tell it to you again. Uh, <clears throat> the lady, when we first came into Greensboro and Winston-Salem, North Carolina, 19, what year was that, 82. This lady, she was quite up in years, but she liked to give the new pastor coming to the area an unleavened cake. Now, she said after service, Mr. Hafley, I'd like you to have this cake. Now, this cake was a pound cake, and it was more than a pound, <laughs> <laughs> and it was tall. And I looked at that, of course, at that time, that was back in 1982. Sure, yeah, pound cake, there's no leavening in them and all of that, <clears throat> but I didn't really know that at the time, and I thought, boy, I'm getting, what do I need to, I need to, I didn't know what to say uh, because it caught me off guard. But it was very interesting. A lot of those people were ahead of me when it came to some of the recipes and things that you can do uh, and that is unleavened, no leavening agents in it. So it can be a lot of fun. We used to be able to have, sometimes it would work out depending on how the holy days fell, the weekly Sabbath during Unleavened Bread uh, <clears throat> featured, in many cases, a uh, potluck, and everybody bring your own homemade unleavened products to share. And it really was a lot of fun. Some of the things I looked at and thought, we need to keep this going all year because <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> why do you want to go back to leavened things? These things are, are, are better. Well, anyhow, I'll, I'll cut this short here just to say that uh, uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of fun. It's something to look forward to. And yes, we clean the leaven out. We get the leaven off our property and uh, look around for some things that you can either buy or things that you can make that are on leaven. Just make it a special feast. God wants us to enjoy it. And it does picture putting sin away. We don't accept the sacrifice of Christ and then carry on with sin, do we? We put the leaven out, the old leaven, we get out and have the unleavened bread instead of sincerity and truth. You know, a lot of things God teaches us is through physical things. Uh, everything in the Bible was to teach us a spiritual lesson. Look at baptism. Uh, why do you need to, uh, to have your sins forgiven? Why do you need to go under water? Because God is trying to teach you you're going to put the old self to death in faith that you're going to come up, come up resurrected to be a new person. Well, look at all of these things we're doing here through the Passover. Christ gave us the new symbols. And even here during unleavened bread. So brethren, let's prepare and look at these things. These are uh, very important physical things that we do and teaching us wonderful spiritual lessons.